everybody, welcome back to my channel. I'm Jenny and I am once again sitting on the floor. I'm here today with my dog Ebenezer and we're going to talk about lupus. I wanna talk about my road to my diagnosis with lupus, which was one hell of a ride. All right, so let's start. Last video, I talked about my kind of mental health decline during the onset of my lupus. To recap that just in like a short little nugget, I have systemic lupus. It took three years for me to get diagnosed with some incorrect diagnoses along the way. And during the onset of my lupus, it first attacked my brain and nervous system, which caused me to have neuropsychiatric symptoms, which changed my personality, made me incredibly suicidal, depressed, anxious, and I had to do a lot to save myself. I made a video about that, so I'll link it below if you want to learn more about what I went through then. I guess I'll touch on that a little bit probably throughout, but I'm gonna primarily talk about my lupus stuff. So lupus is an autoimmune disorder. It's chronic, there is no cure, unfortunately right now. There's constantly clinical trials going on. They're trying to find a cure. Years ago, when you were diagnosed with lupus, there was like a five year life expectancy. Now with the right medication and treatment, people can live normal lives. There are different kinds of lupus. There's lupus that affects your skin. There's lupus that affects your nervous system. There's lupus that affects your kidneys. And I happen to have systemic lupus, which affects my entire system. Basically, it's a connective tissue disorder that causes inflammation in my connective tissue. All of our organs, everything in our body is put together with connective tissue. So basically, my immune system is thinking that the good guys in my body are the bad guys and they're attacking it and it's causing inflammation and it hurts me. It can be as innocent as my joints hurt, I get a skin rash, little things like that To If major organs get inflammation, it can cause some really serious things. Every person who has lupus has a different experience with lupus, it's just all similar. Like we all have kind of overlapping similar things, but nobody, no two people have the same, like we have the exact same lupus experience. Ebenezer, come. I don't trust her, she's gonna get into something. Yeah, come here, I don't trust you, yeah. Okay, <laughs> I'm sure you've heard about lupus in the past couple of years because Selena Gomez and Lady Gaga have made it pretty talked about topic because Selena Gomez has lupus, hers affected her kidneys, she had to have a kidney transplant. Lady Gaga, her whole Joanne tour and everything and an album was about her aunt who had died from lupus at a young age. It's definitely getting out there and being talked about. The thing with lupus is, at least for me, so I don't have kidney involvement yet. And I'm told that if you don't have kidney involvement in the first five years, chances are you won't and there are medications I'm on to prevent my body from going in that direction. I'm now four years into my lupus, no kidney involvement, so hopefully I won't have anything in the next year and then that would be great. Let me start back in the beginning because it took forever to figure out I had lupus. It's a very, very hard thing to diagnose because it mimics so many other diseases and there's not like one specific test that's like, yep, you have lupus. There are things you have to have. I'm trying to like pull up the symptoms here because I really want to make this informational, but why is my phone like to get a lupus diagnosis, there are certain factors you have to have and then the doctor will make a diagnosis based on that. So I'll pull that up and go over that in a second. Let me start at the beginning. In the very end of 2013, I started getting an immense amount of anxiety that was abnormal. My personality started changing and I also developed a rash that covered the entire backside of my body. The rash lasted three to four months. I went to a ton of doctors. I was asked anything from, could you have syphilis? Are you allergic to things? It's contact dermatitis. A dermatologist told me it was a virus. No medications worked at the same time I'm was full of ulcers and it was disgusting. Over the course of that year, my personality started changing. I became suicidal, depressed, anxious, super paranoid. I didn't trust people. I only trusted certain ones of my friends. And then I started having a lot of physical symptoms. My eyesight started becoming blurry. My vision was doubled and my eyes just hurt really bad. And I was getting migraines a lot. My blood sugar wouldn't stabilize. I was in and out of the hospital. I cannot count the amount of times that I had to be rushed to the hospital in an ambulance because of my blood sugar wouldn't stabilize. I started having a lot of neuropathy symptoms, like nerve symptoms, burning, itching, tingling, numbness in my legs and arms. I was starting to have myoclonic jerks, which means that my muscles would just start moving. I remember I was at my friend's house one time and we were sitting on the couch and all of a sudden my legs were jerking up and down. And she was like, this is a trip, this is crazy. And I had a whole lot of doctors, they were all awful. I wasn't making a lot of money at the time, so I was on Medi-Cal, which is California's government assisted program, which literally I'm so grateful for and so blessed because the amount of doctors and hospital trips and 
tests I had would have bankrupted me. There's no way I could have ever afforded it. And the bulk of that happened while I was still on Medi-Cal. But at the same time, the majority of my doctors were not as good. And I later found out, I think it's because they have so many more patients to see they can't give them as much time. I think as doctors who aren't treating Medi-Cal patients, if I understood that correctly, I've had a doctor explain that to me. My main reason I think they were awful was nobody ever looked at the big picture. Nobody ever put everything together that was happening to me. They either took like little things that were happening and saying, oh, this is because of that and this is because of that, or it's all because of your anxiety. Anxiety is causing all of this. I just knew that this wasn't me, that this something was happening to me. I eventually got diagnosed with fibromyalgia which made kind of sense at the time I felt like it was a lot more than that but also if anyone tried to touch with fibromyalgia there's some uh, tender points on your body and if anyone tried to touch me it hurt so bad I think though that was because I was having a lot of inflammation in my nervous system that caused that so I don't believe I have fibromyalgia but I was diagnosed that is at a, t at a time and I thought I had it we tried so many medications I remember being tested for MS a lot oh my battery's dying okay I was tested for MS a lot. I had so many MRIs and I remember they were so hard. One time I had to have a three hour MRI and my body would jerk a lot. My, mus my muscles couldn't stand being still. I was in just everything hurt so much. And at that time I wasn't walking well. And then I stopped being able to know basic things. I was driving to work one day. I explained this in my last video and I couldn't remember how to get there. I stopped and pulled over on the side of the road. One time stood in front of my door. For like five minutes I couldn't figure out how to lock it. And then I'm an actress and I remember going to a casting director's office. It was a new casting director who had never auditioned me before. So I was really excited and I really prepared these two sides for it. I was ready and I went in and I had no recollection of anything. And I remember I saw the look on her face of, oh, look at this unprofessional girl. And I was like, what is happening? This is ruining my everything. I lost all my friends. I ended up losing my job. I ended up having to go to physical therapy to even be able to walk. I had to wear glasses for the first time. My mom flew in and stayed with me for a month because I couldn't take care of myself. I couldn't even lift things and barely could walk. It was just a very scary time. Nobody knew what was wrong with me and I kept looking up all these things and my doctors either didn't believe me. I really thought it was my anxiety. This crisis counselor I was seeing for all my neuropsychiatric suicidal symptoms, she thought it was hysteria. She thought I was so anxious my body was just making all this stuff happen. One of my best friends at the time started believing that too and it got so frustrating that like I pulled myself away from her because I was like, you're not even believing this and she had her own chronic illness and I think that just was so frustrating to me because I, I know this is real and to have even one of my close friends not believe me was just hard. So okay, so I started getting tested for MS because I started researching like here are all of my symptoms and I had a whole bunch of symptoms. What could it possibly be? And I looked through all sorts of things and MS kept coming up and it's terrified me, but I was like, let me at least try to rule this out. I had a ton of MRIs. I never showed any lesions in my body that would show up if you had MS, but I also was seeing an optometrist at the time who told me that didn't necessarily mean anything that they can show up later. My neurologist at the time wasn't listening to me. I remember I went to this place and they, they dressed me like Frankenstein. I had all these electrodes on my head. Basically, they try to induce a seizure. They do all these strobe lights and stuff. I remember distinctly being in that room. It was at a hospital. So I parked. I walked. Walked into the hospital fine. I had the procedure. It was me and another man in the room. I was lying on a bed. I had all these electrodes on my head and he was doing, they do all these like light tests and things and, and then they have a machine hooked up to the electrodes and the, this like monitor guy will watch the machine to see if there's any seizure activity. First of all, this isn't always accurate because people who do have like epilepsy, even if they don't have a seizure in the room, it doesn't mean they don't have seizures and sometimes it won't even show activity unless you're actively having a seizure. So I just I just remember lying there and when it came to the strobe light part, my body started jerking, my myoclonic jerk started happening. Well, the guy wasn't looking at me and it wasn't registering on the machine. And I don't know how any of that works. So I don't have a history of seizures. So maybe that doesn't register on the machine. Either way, he didn't physically see it. And when it was over, I was like, you saw that, right? And he said, no. And I explained it and he said, okay, well, I'll write it down in what happened. And I said, thanks. Well, I couldn't really move after that. It was so hard for me to move. And I remember trying to walk out and I couldn't, and I slid down the wall and it felt like my body was filling with concrete and they wheelchaired me out to my car. And I didn't know if I was able to drive home. I ended up being able to, but that symptom happened a lot. The concrete feeling, my blood sugar would never stabilize for several years. 
years. Whatever would happen with my blood sugar is if I felt like my blood sugar was dropping and I was somehow able to eat the right, you know, the, the foods or whatever to bring it back up. If I did that within a certain window, I would be okay. I'd still feel like iffy, but I'd be okay. But if I didn't meet that window, it didn't matter if I ate those foods and it brought my blood sugar up. My body would slowly go into a state where I couldn't really move and it would last like two hours and nobody believed me. It was bizarre because it happened all the time. I was so lethargic. It sounded like I'm drunk when I was talking. I couldn't think. It was just so hard to communicate. The only thing that would make me ever get out of that was two hours would pass, I would get IVs, and then I would slowly start having energy again and I'd be able to function. After that test, when that happened, I think that has to be some kind of symptom within me that causes this extreme lethargy. It hasn't happened in so long, knock on fake wood. I am on medication now. But I remember what was weird was when I would go to the hospital, there were several times people would be like, do you have lupus? Because you have like a little butterfly rash on your cheek. It's like very faint. It never really thought to me to be like, hey, maybe really see if I have lupus because I had a rheumatologist at the time who had diagnosed me with fibromyalgia. So anyway, long story short, I had a bunch of tests. I had those MRIs for M MS and I still wasn't convinced I didn't have MS, but I was, I didn't know. One of the MRIs showed that I had got a tumor on my C4 vertebrae. My neurologist didn't tell me that. I always get all of my, my uh, blood work, paperwork, and all of my doctor stuff and I research it on my own because I learned that I had to advocate for myself and my doctors were not listening to me and paying the attention they needed. When that doctor said that he was gonna write that my, I was having those jerks during that seizure test, he didn't. So when I told my neurologist about it, my neurologist was like, well, the doctor didn't write it, so whatever. And I go, but it happened. Don't you want to write it down? And he goes, you already have a history of myoclonic jerks, just gets in your chart. And I said, but there's not a history of it happening during that test. Shouldn't that be written down? And I remember it was a whole argument. It was bizarre. The same neurologist, when I had the MRI, it said something about a tumor on my C4 vertebrae. And I was like, uh, excuse me, what is that? I ended up having another doctor explain to me what it was, a vertebral hemangioma, I believe is how you pronounce it. It's a tumor on my vertebra that is, it's a series of blood vessels. It's not like um, a mass, it's not like um, a tissue. It's a bunch of blood vessels have formed a tumor and it had grown because I looked on my uh, MRI from several months and it had grown and, and when you're not able to walk, when you're using a cane to walk and you're trying to figure out why and you see on an MRI that you have some tumor on your vertebrae that nobody is like even connecting maybe that's why I was getting so frustrated. I later found out that those are not serious. I think I have to be careful of being hit there because it would rupture because I think if you try to remove it that's what's dangerous because you can bleed to death because it's such a like vascular area. So I have to be like careful of being hit there and I have to be careful like, if I go to a chiropractor I think I need to be really careful. I had to go seek out another doctor to tell me that because my neurologist was an awful person. The word tumor freaks anyone out and especially if you don't know what's happening to your body. Thank God it wasn't anything serious. And I also had these muscle nerve tests where they stick these electrodes. They stick your, these like electrodes in your legs and arms to stimulate your nerves to see if any of your peripheral nerves are damaged. So I was having so many neuropathy issues. They turned out fine, but the doctor said, well, this means your major nerves aren't damaged, but your minor, the little nerves that stem out from them, they could very well be damaged. This test doesn't show that. I eventually did so much research. I thought this could be lupus because I do, I am getting this rash on my face a lot. And I looked up the symptoms of lupus and maybe I did have it. And so my rheumatologist the time was gonna give me the lupus test, but I was so scared. I was so scared to get diagnosed with it because everything I read scared me. I know that the life expectancy used to be five years. I was so traumatized by being the way doctors had treated me that it got to the point where I was almost like, I can't see another doctor anymore. I just can't. So I remember holding on to that test for so long because I couldn't have that doctor tell me that this was in my head or not believe the test results or do something like there. I couldn't handle being not listened to again. I just couldn't handle it. And that doctor kept blaming, blaming everything on my anxiety. As a rheumatologist, you think he would have been like, ha, huh, maybe this is neuropsychiatric stuff going on. No. But I did a lot of research. I found this doctor in Los Angeles that was a rheumatologist who not only specialized, he's like the top lupus doctor in the country, but he also has written books on fibromyalgia. And I was like, okay, well, this guy is so well respected. He's written so many books. He does all these clinical trials. He teaches at an amazing university. He's the head of one of the top hospitals in the country or for the rheumatology department. And if he tells me these same things these other doctors tell me, 
then I'll believe it because this is a reputable person. To get in with him, I had to fill out an 18 page medical questionnaire and that was the first time any doctor had done that extensive of a background on me, my family, both my parents, and then he wanted to see all my medical tests. So I sent them to him. Then what would happen because he's so sought after as a doctor and so busy, if he thinks he can might, might can help you, then you're allowed to go in for an appointment. Well, I got that call. I remember when I got the call that he w wanted to see me. I started crying. I was so happy. And I made like a Facebook status about maybe this is the person who's going to actually make my life better again. I met with him and he talked to me and then he did a bunch of blood work and then I was told to come back and he said, okay, well, this is not in your head. This blood work shows that this stuff's happening. And he explained basically that like, there's a lot of markers for lupus that um, a lot of people have that I, do, I did not test positive for, but there were some I do. So there are 11 criteria for lupus. You have to have at least four to make a diagnosis. Out of this blood test, I had some things were positive. I had these antiphospholipid antibodies that I was positive for and I'm positive for the worst kind, which means my blood, I have a like a blood clotting disorder that can potentially be very, very serious. And people with lupus are already at a higher chance of having a blood clot. And then if you have this blood clotting disorder on top of it, you're at an even a higher chance. And then if you have the worst kinds of these antiphospholipid phospholipid antibodies, you're at an even higher risk. My doctor explained to me that um, the medication I'm on will help prevent that from happening. I take a baby aspirin every day and then if for some reason I ever do get a blood clot, then it becomes officially antiphospholipid syndrome and then you have to get on a blood thinner, which hopefully I never have to do because my dad had to do that and it scares me. There are 11 criteria for lupus. A malar rash, a malar rash is the butterfly rash that's kind of known the lupus symbol. Over the years, I have a very, very distinct malar rash now when I'm sick. It gets very, very red and very, very distinct. Four years ago, it was very mild. It just, it got slowly worse. A discoid rash, like a skin rash, which are raised red patches. I do not have photosensitivity. That means like if you go out into the sun, you'll get a rash. I don't, but I do have photosensitivity in the sense that if I'm in the sun, I'll start physically getting sick. Mouth or nozzle, nose ulcers, I get very bad mouth ulcer ulcers. Arthritis in two or more joints. I get arthritis in my knees and because lupus uh, inflames connective tissue I've had some injuries for a very long time that won't heal no matter how much physical therapy or how much I do to them And that's why because they keep getting it re-inflamed And so now that I know that it all makes sense why I have like an elbow and a knee injury Neurological disorders or psychosis. I had neurological disorders kidney disorder, which I don't have a blood disorder like anemia low white blood cell count, low platelet count. I did have that when I first started getting sick because I had been on medication and stuff and, and my symptoms kind of changed by the time I saw the doctor. That wasn't as present as it had been years before. The antibodies and then a positive ANA, which is the anti-nuclear antibodies, I had that. And then they test a bunch of other things. They test levels of just different like sediment levels in your body. Um, and I tested positive for some of those, but there are some some lupus stuff. I can make a, like a more in-depth video about all of that. I'm not a doctor and I don't want people being like, you don't know what you're talking about right now. So when I talk about that, I want it to be like, actual, have the information in front of me so I can like tell you about it. Right now I'm just talking about my story and like my diagnosis. The doctor said to me, he said, okay, so this doesn't show me that you 100% have lupus, but it shows me that you, it doesn't show me that you don't have lupus, but it does show me that you have a connective tissue disease. So right now I'm going to diagnose you with und undifferentiated connective tissue disease, which means I have all these symptoms, but they can't 100% say it's this disease. It's definitely a connective tissue disease, but it doesn't have like a name yet. So it's under this umbrella term, undifferentiated connective tissue disease or UCTD. So he said, I'm gonna give you a shot right now. I want you to come back in a month and we're gonna see how the shot affects you. And that's gonna let me know what's going on. So he gives, he gives me this shot in my butt. I, I hadn't felt that good in so long that month. I called it the miracle shot. I felt so good. And then literally a month later, it felt, it was like, Bam, my knees swelled up. They were throbbing. Oh, it was awful. I started getting so sick. I had to get these braces on my knees that like compressed them, but also had these like metal rods in them just so I could move. And I had to use my cane and I just, 
I remember calling the doctor and being like, something's happening to me. And he said, basically, I guess that that was my body overreacting to having been on that medication. It was like my body was rebelling. And so I had all these arthritis symptoms. So that's when they knew I had lupus. I started on this medication called Plaquenil, which is an anti-malarial that, I mean, I think every lupus patient is on, or at least the high majority of every lupus patient is on because they notice that even though it's to treat malaria, it helps tremendously in people with lupus and people with rheumatoid arthritis, incidentally. So I'll be on Plaquenil probably the rest of my life unless they find a cure. And it, it doesn't really have any bad symptoms for me. The only thing is you have to be very careful about your eyes. It can cause retina damage, but usually that's, it's, it's rare A and B, it doesn't happen right away. It's years from now, and as long as you're seeing a good eye doctor, they can make sure that doesn't happen. You know, like they can see if it's starting to happen or anything like that. So I take that twice a day, and that's what I took for a while. And I started seeing a psychiatrist who understood lupus. We figured out what my flares were because when my lupus started, it affected my brain and nervous system, but over the years, it changed to start affecting my joints and muscles. Now when I'm starting to get a flare, I get the same symptoms. I'll get, start getting incredibly depressed, which means my brain's getting inflamed again, but I'll also get a, a, a really bad malar rash. I'll start having joint pain in my knees. I'll start having these phantom rashes on my body. It's like my, my, my skin will show rashes that are there for 30 minutes and they disappear. I'll get ulcers and I get migraines. That's typically now what I, I'm learning is my, um, an extreme fatigue are my flares. I got diagnosed in March of last year. Throughout the year, there were periods of me getting better and then flares and getting better and then flares. And then what my doctor would do is give me that shot because I tried prednisone and it makes me feel very sick. So I didn't want to be on that anymore. My doctor gives me this like steroid shot in my butt when I'm having a really bad flare. Got to the point where I was doing really bad uh, this past November and December. So I got the shot in November. It only lasted six weeks and I went back to the doctor and I was like, I'm not doing well at all. So we had to talk about what we could put me on. But he said, you're too sick right now to be on that medicine now. We have to reduce this inflammation before we can begin on other medicines. So then I got another shot and then I went back to him and we started me on this medication called methotrexate, which is a form of chemotherapy. I don't take a chemo level dose. I take a, like a small dose and I give myself a shot once a week in my leg. And I've been doing that for a little over two months now, two, three months now, and I'm noticing a huge difference. I haven't had to have another steroid shot. My energy levels are increasing. I haven't had to use my cane. I'm starting to feel like I can hang out with people again and do things. My work is so amazing. They're allowing me to work from home as much as I need to. I'm just, I'm lucky that I have a job that can be done both in the office and at home. Having a chronic illness is so expensive. It's so expensive. My doctor's not covered by my insurance, only like a tiny portion is, and my medication is expensive, and everything's just so expensive. So at least I'm able to still work while all this is happening. My doctor actually contacted me last week. He thinks I'm a perfect fit for this clinical trial that he wants to do, or he's doing, that he's running. Um, and he said that my profile fits perfectly for the type of lupus I have. I'm hesitant about it because I, it, my shots are working and I finally do have, I'm getting my life back. Like I'm starting to act again. I'm able to walk a lot and do things. I'm not spending the majority of my day in bed. This past year, I would go to work or I would work for eight hours. I might be up in about two hours and the rest of the time I'm flat on my back in bed. Like I have no muscle tone anymore. I really don't have a working body. I'm getting that back now. Hopefully over time, you know, I'll be able to rebuild my muscle tone and be more active. The idea of a clinical trial, A, if I got the placebo and then I just started getting sick again because I already know that without medication I get really sick. So that scares me and I also just have so much more and at my age, like I want to do and at my age, if this was like 10 years ago, maybe it would be different, but I'm at an age where I really, if I want to have a child eventually, I have to seriously think about it and I can't on the medication I'm on. And I'm not at a place financially where I could afford that, but I'm also at this age where it's like, oh, well, you need to freeze your eggs if you're not gonna have a baby right now. But I can't do that while I'm on my medicine. So I'm trying to work it out so I can be on this medication enough, like long enough that I'm in a place where I can work and get to a place financially within the next one or two years, hopefully, where I can kind of slowly transition to completely working from home. So when I go off this medication, which will have to be out of my body for a while, because I don't want my baby to have like five heads, it has to be out of my body for a while before I could start even like trying to do fertility stuff. That scares me because it'll be a rough 
period. There's just like a lot I have to think about and so the idea of doing a clinical trial, it just seemed scary. Oh, so I get very dry eyes, dry everything. That's kind of excruciatingly painful. October of this past year, it got to the point where it was so painful that I went to the doctor crying and I was like, something's really wrong with me. And I was diagnosed with um, a secondary autoimmune disease called Sjogren's syndrome, which basically my exocrine glands are damaged or my body's like attacking my exocrine glands. So the exocrine glands are the ones that secrete moisture. I had to go to the, the eye doctor and they had to do all these tests. Like they stuck these like papers in my eyes and stuff to test my moisture levels and then did stuff and they found out that my oil ducts on my eyelids are um, damaged. So my tears evaporate very quickly. So I have to have these eye medication now to like help my eyes that for that not to happen. It affects literally everything in my body, throat, my chest, my vagina, my mouth. I get really bad dry mouth. There's medication for that. It makes me violently ill, unfortunately. Honestly, the Sjogren's syndrome symptoms were so bad at one point that I was like, I would gladly walk with a cane right now than to have these. Whereas when I used to walk with a cane, I was like, please, no more canes, please. So my doctor told me that this these chemo shots will for, it, it took a little over a month for them to start helping my lupus symptoms. So I had to wait that out. For my Sjogren syndrome, syndrome symptoms, it'll take six months, he said, for them to start working. So I just have to wait that out. So that means even more when I go off this medication to try to do fertility stuff to either freeze my eggs or have a baby, it's gonna take even longer once I, cause I'm gonna immediately go back on my medication, but it's gonna take even longer for it to, I have to wait for it to kick in again. So there's gonna be a long period where I could potentially be very sick. So I'm trying to get in a place financially or at least job wise where I can have the option of working for, from home full time because life is expensive. Everything I've been through has kind of led me to where I am now and this is not even anywhere where I thought I would have been. If you've, at four years ago, I was an auditioning actor who was performing theater weekly who was constantly creating stuff with, with the comedy community in Los Angeles to not being able to walk or get out of bed. I had followed everyone on social media, I remember, because it was just so hard seeing people living their lives and I couldn't do anything. I'm slowly able to do things. Like I have an acting show this month, I get to do a bit in a show. I'm just grateful that everything's working now and I really hope it continues to work. But lupus comes and goes and in terms of flares and it's very possible I'll get a bad flare again. But the good thing is, is I'm on a low enough dose of this chemo medication that they can always up it. Like there's room for it to go up. Worst comes to worst, I will have to increase. And I actually had to increase my dose the past two weeks, just for those two weeks. And it caused my entire mouth to swell. And like my whole left side of my mouth was so swollen and torn up and there were ulcers everywhere. And it was really, I'm sorry this is gross, but this is the reality of my disease. I knew it was because of that. And I take folic acid. I have to take that for these shots to prevent this stuff from happening. But I think because I had been on such a higher dose, my body was like, ah, and it did it. So then now I'm doubling up on those and my mouth's fine now. And everything. So anyway, I think that's all I have to say about lupus right now. I'm sure I've forgotten stuff and this is literally my life right now. I'm trying not to make it my identity. When I first got diagnosed, my entire identity was being sick because I didn't know what was happening to me. All I could do was doctors test research trying to figure out what was happening to me. That was my life. And now that it's more under control, I am Jenny. I am not lupus. I'm Jenny. I just happen to have lupus and Sjogren's. Anyway, I've been talking forever. So I'm going to go now. This was my lupus story. Thank you for watching. If if you want to see more videos, please subscribe to my channel. Uh, like this video if you want more videos like this. Um, if you have any questions or you want videos of certain things, please comment below. I'm starting a series called Chronically Awesome where I'm going to start interviewing friends and family that have chronic illness. It's gonna be a huge passion project I'm doing because I really want to start talking about all of this. I'm gonna start filming that soon, but in the meantime, I'm going to keep filming videos about myself and anything I can think of that might could help other people. And I think that's it. Have a great day.